Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe, and this is Games with Gabe, and this is the next episode in the Coding a 2D Game Engine in Java series. So in this episode, what we will be getting done is the scale gizmo and the rotate gizmo. So we will be getting both of these completely functional. The previous episode was sort of setting up the base technique, and now we will set it up so that we can actually move them, and then we can switch to scale mode, and we can also scale objects up and down. So this is obviously a really good point to be at with our engine because now we can move our objects around and we have some more steps to take to make it a more workable engine but this is definitely a really big leap forwards in terms of getting things done so in order to get this done we will have to do a few different things one of the things we'll be getting done is getting our drag listener working inside of our mouse listener so that we can actually get drag events and sort of deal with those appropriately. So we'll take a look at that first and then we'll go ahead and actually implement the scale gizmo and the translate gizmo. So let's get started. All right, so how do we actually tell how far to move an object based on when somebody clicks a gizmo? Well, the answer is actually relatively simple. So if somebody clicks onto one of the gizmos, say they click here and they click here at frame zero, okay? This could be any frame. It doesn't really matter what frame it was. Now let's exaggerate the movement. Say the next frame, the mouse position is over here. So this is frame one. And this is highly unrealistic because moving the mouse from here to here in one frame just most likely will not happen. But we're just exaggerating it for illustration. So if the mouse is here frame zero, and actually let's make this a little more complicated. Let's say the mouse moves down to here at frame one. So the mouse clicks onto the gizmo, it's still holding down, frame one, it's over here. How far do we move the object? Well, that's simple. We just move the object this X distance, right? So whatever this, I'm gonna call this delta X is, that's how far we move the object, right? So how do we get that delta X in the frame? That's pretty simple too. We just calculate how far the mouse has moved in X distance only between frame zero and frame one. So we could call this x, y, and that'll be like x, 0, y, 0, and this will be x, 1, y, 1, okay? So we track what the x's position was in frame 0. This is what the mouse's position is now. How far do we move the object? Well, we just add x, 1 minus x, 0 plus, and we'll call the object just g, x position, right? So the game object's new x position is just equal to x1 minus x0 plus the game object's position. And intuitively, that makes sense. We're just moving at the distance that the mouse moved in the x coordinates. It really is this simple. There's no hidden gotchas or anything when it comes to this. And so we just have to calculate how far the mouse has moved in the x coordinates between frames. And that's how far we move the object, okay? So how do we scale it then? Say these were scale arrows instead of regular arrows. I'm gonna blow your minds here because it's literally the same thing. <laughs> it's just the scale of X would be X1 minus X0 plus the original scale of X. Now you might actually uh, factor this. So what I did was I actually had a scale for the scale. So instead of just doing X1 minus X0, I multiply by some factor. We'll call that F. And then I add that to the scale's position. And this factor is just some number uh, less than one. And the reason I do that is just because if we do this big of a scale change, usually that's bigger than what you would want. You would want it to incrementally go. So if you do like 0 0.5 and just multiply those by it, it'll just scale it slower or faster. It's basically the speed, the sensitivity, if you will, sort of like we did with mouse sensitivity. Now this is all in good and stuff, but right now we have no way to detect mouse dragging accurately in our game engine. So we are also going to implement proper mouse dragging. Now, how do you tell the mouse is dragging? Well, that's actually not too bad either. The way you can tell that the mouse is dragging is say the user clicks down and uh, at least one mouse button is down and you get a mouse move event. So it's currently pressed some button and it has moved. Then this is now a drag event and no longer a click event. So let's go ahead and implement the mouse dragging. And then once we get mouse dragging implemented into our mouse listener, we'll go ahead and implement the whole scaling and translating gizmos. Okay, so where we last left off last episode was we just had these gizmos pop up whenever you click onto one of the objects in the scene. And now we wanna actually make them work and not fly away, which I said we fixed, but we didn't. And there's an actual reason for why they fly away like that. So 
we'll take a look at that and make sure it doesn't happen anymore as well. So the first thing we're gonna implement is we're gonna go ahead and go to the mouse listener class and actually get the whole drag working and then the get DX and get DY working as well. Well, actually these do work fine still, it's just the dragging is not working. So right now what we're doing is we're just saying if we pressed then uh, basically, well, actually it just looks like we never set dragging to true, we just set it to false. So we will fix that. Now we are gonna add a couple more variables in here just for some help with uh, getting positions in world space. So I'm gonna go ahead and define some more variables up here called world X, world Y, and then last world X and last world Y, first of all. And so these are just gonna be the same things as these, just calculated in world coordinates, because currently, if somebody asks for, if we go down to here, the get ortho X and get ortho Y, uh, which is basically get world X, we calculate it on the fly every time. And this is bad because what if somebody asks for it multiple times in a frame? We don't want to recalculate it. So we should have done this a while ago, but we didn't. So now we are doing it. We're just going to go into here and say private stack or static void calc ortho X. And then we're just going to copy all this, paste it into here. And then we're gonna say get dot ortho x, or actually world x equals current x. So we basically just do that. And we could actually copy this and paste it over that and then get rid of this line completely. So now we have a calculate method. And then what we're gonna do here is just say return get dot world x instead of ortho x. And then we'll go ahead and do the same thing for, and we have to cast that to a float too. So just cast that to a float and then we'll do the same thing for ortho y. So we'll just go ahead and create a public static, or actually this is private, static void calc ortho y. We will copy and paste all of this once again. And then right here, we'll just say get dot world y equals temp dot y. And then we can go ahead and remove all of that. And then right up here, we can just say return get dot world y and we'll cast that to a float. Okay, so that's just a little bit of refactoring, but this is good because now we can make sure that we only calculate once a frame and then if somebody asks for it, we get it. All right, and so when should we calculate the world x and world y? Well, we'll calculate that every time the mouse position callback is called because this means the mouse has moved. This way we can just make sure that we get the correct position every time we call those functions. So what we'll do is we'll just say get dot last world x equals get dot world x. So we will just track the last position so that we have access to those if we need them. And then like we have right here, we will just go ahead and say calculate ortho x and calculate ortho y. So this will basically just do the same thing these are doing, which is saying, hey, calculate the new position with the new expos. Make sure you put these below this too, since it uses these values. Then we're going to remove this get dot is dragging equals blah, blah, blah. That's what we were using to calculate dragging before and it does not work good at all. So the way we can calculate whether or not we're dragging, like I said, is if they click down and then they move the mouse, that is a drag. If they just click down, but they don't move the mouse, then that's not a drag, that's a click. So how do we check and see if that's happening? Well, I'm just gonna add a new variable up here. Private int um, mouse buttons down equals zero. So this is the number of mouse buttons that are being held down. And so then we will go to the mouse button callback every time a press is hit, we say mouse button down, plus plus. And every time a release is hit, we say minus minus. So when this is zero, the mouse button's down, then this means there are no bounces, mouse buttons being pressed. When it is greater than zero, it means there's a mouse button being pressed. So we can just go up to here and when the mouse is moved, we can say if get the mouse button down is greater than zero. If we have one mouse button that is being down, and we just moved the mouse, then that means we're dragging. So we'll say get dot is dragging equals true, and that should be good. And then how do we know that the drag has ended? Well, we can just do the same thing we were doing before, where if the mouse button is released, then we'll say get dot is dragging equals false. Technically, we could put something like uh, equals get dot mouse button down is equals zero, I guess, but I'm not doing that because if they hold down like two buttons at the same time, I, I don't, I'm not sure when I consider that an end drag and everything. So we'd have to look more into that stuff. But for now, this is fine. Uh, this will calculate when we get a drag and when we don't get a drag. Then we're going to go down here and we're just going to make some similar methods to these. We're going to say public static float 
get world dx. This will do the same thing as this function. It will just do it with the world positions instead. So we'll say get last world x minus uh, get dot world x. And then we'll do the same thing for dy. So we'll just copy and paste this. And we will remove that and change this to y and change this to y. All right. So this way we can get the world dx and then get the world dy, which should help us out. Now we can check and see if this is working very quickly. We'll just go into the translate gizmo in the update function. We'll just say if mouse listener dot is dragging uh, system dot out dot print line dragging. So now if we go into here, we should be able to drag. And once we start dragging the mouse, it'll say dragging. And so if I go into here, yeah, you'll notice it says dragging down there. But if I click and I hold and I don't move the mouse, it doesn't say dragging. Okay, so that works good. Now we have a method to check and see if the mouse is in fact dragging. Now that we know that, we need a way to tell if the mouse is over the gizmo or not so that we can tell if we're hovering over the gizmo. So I'm going to go into the gizmo class and we're going to declare just a couple more variables. Uh, we're going to call this int sprite. Or actually, I'll call this gizmo width, which equals 16. That's the width of the gizmo in world units. Gizmo height equals 48. That is the height of the gizmo in world units. This is important so that we can tell when the mouse is inside the gizmo. And then I'm just going to go down here. And first of all, I'm going to move this whole this dot active game object equals null thing to below this whole thing. And then basically, if it's not null, then we're just going to return here. So basically, if there is no active game object, we'll just exit early instead of going on with the function. Then I'm going to go ahead and we'll go up here and we will say boolean x axis hot. So this is the x axis gizmo, the little red arrow that points to the right. And I'm going to say it equals check x hover state. So this will basically just check whether the mouse is hovering over the x axis gizmo. And then we'll say boolean y axis hot equals check y hover state. And these are going to be very similar functions, basically the same. Uh, and they're just going to check and see if the mouse is hovering over that specific gizmo. So we're going to say private boolean uh, check x hover state. This will just check whether the mouse is hovering over the x axis gizmo. So we'll say vector 2f mouse pose. And this is the mouse position world coordinates is a uh, new vector 2f mouse listener dot get ortho x mouse listener dot get ortho y. And then we can just say if mouse pose dot x is less than or equal to x axis object dot transform dot position dot x and x mouse pose dot x. And I'm going to move this to a new line. We're going to say is greater than or equal to x axis object dot transform dot position dot x minus the sprite height or actually this is gizmo height. Sorry. <laughs> And this is why we're separating it into two functions is because the x-axis object is actually longer than it is tall. And so we said gizmo height is 48, but technically that's the width of the x-axis gizmo. So we just separate it into two functions so that we can check these separately. Then we'll say and mouse pose dot y is less than or equal to y axis object dot transform dot position dot y and mouse pose dot y is greater than or equal to y axis object dot transform dot position dot y plus sprite width or gizmo width. And I think I have these backwards. This should be greater than this should be less than and these two should be all right. Okay, so this basically just checks and see if the mouse is inside of the width and the height. It's a simple box detection. I've got some more videos that you can check out for more information on how box detection works. But basically the point inside a box just means that the point is, points x is less than the box's right x and greater than the box's left x. y is greater than the top y, less than the bottom y. And that's exactly what we're doing. Okay, so if all this is true, we're going to say x axis object or x axis sprite dot set color. And then we want to set the color to the x axis color hover. So we just set the color and then we will return true. Otherwise, we'll say x axis sprite dot set color to x axis color. And then we'll return false. So if we are hovering over the sprite, we set it to the color hover. Otherwise, we set it to the regular color and then we just return whichever of those it is. Now let's go ahead and check the y hover state, which is very similar. So we'll just say private boolean paste that 
I will copy all this and then we will change the things appropriately. So we just wanna make this minus the gizmo width now and we want to make this minus the gizmo height and then we just wanna swap this to a less than or equal to and swap this to a greater than or equal to. Um, the way I found these, I just sort of messed around with it because with the rotation stuff, it does throw things off a little bit. So I just messed around with the greater than, less than, or equal to signs and then the plus and the minus to get it exactly right. Okay, then we'll say Y axis sprite and just change this to Y axis color hover. So Y axis color hover, and then we will change this to Y axis sprite and change this to Y axis color, not hover. Okay, so now if we run this, we should see that when we hover over either of these, it should change. Okay, so we're getting that. That looks like it's in the wrong place completely though. Oh, and I see the problem here. So I changed this to Y axis object. This should be X axis object. And this should be Y axis object because we're checking the objects and I sort of swapped those around for some reason. Okay, so now if we run this, okay, there we go. So when I'm hovering inside of either of the gizmos, they change to their respective color. And we can actually change that color real quick too, just to make it a little bit better. So the colors I am using are for the non hover, I use uh, 0.3F, 0.3F here, and then I just go 1001 for the hover. And then I do 0.3F here, and 0.3F here, and then just 0101. So that gives it just like a dark tint when you hover over it instead of going completely black. So there we go. You notice that when I hover over them, they get a little bit darker. You can tweak it however you want and that should be fine. Now we need to make it so that it doesn't do that first of all. Uh, well actually, yeah, we need to do that first. So let's make it so that it doesn't fly off. First of all, why is it actually flying off that way? Well, if we go to the properties window, what happens when we click down on any object? Well, it gets the ID of the game object and then it sets the active game object to that ID. Well, what just happens when we click on the arrow, well, we click on the arrow and then it sets the active game object to the arrow. So it's constantly trying to position itself in front of itself and then it ends up flying away like that. And so we need to fix that. And that's pretty easy. We can just fix it by basically saying, hey, set the active game object as long as it's not one of the gizmos. Or uh, in the case of what I did is I did this thing where I said new Java class and I call this non-pickable. And we're just going to say this extends component. This class does absolutely nothing. Okay. It's just there for us to go into here and then say uh, game object picked object equals. And then we will just copy and paste this. And then we'll say if picked object does not equal null and picked object dot get component non pickable dot class does equal null. Only then will we set the active game object to the picked object. Otherwise, we don't. So then we'll say else if picked object equals null and not picked object, and we're not dragging right now, so and not mouse listener dot is dragging, uh, then we will say active game object equals null. So basically, we just check and see if that object has this non pickable class. If it does, then we will not set it. Now this isn't going to fix it immediately because if we go in, we'll click onto it and it'll still fly away. So we can fix that by going into our translate gizmo. And then when we go ahead and add these objects, we'll just go down here and we'll say this dot X axis object dot add component non pickable dot class, or actually a new non pickable. And then we'll say this dot Y axis object dot add component new non pickable. All right, now if we go into here, since they have the non-pickable class, it doesn't trigger it when we click on these, but it does trigger if we click on anything else. Okay, so now they're not flying away anymore and we can correctly start doing the drag events and actually using that. So if we go back down to the update method, we have this whole X axis is hot, Y axis is hot. So now we know whether we are hovering over the X axis or the Y axis. And we can say if uh, X axis is hot, and mouse listener dot is dragging and mouse listener dot mouse button down or and we'll say Jill FW mouse button left. So if they're dragging the left mouse button and then just click onto here and hit alt enter to import that static constant. So if the X axis is hot, we're hovering over the X axis gizmo and we're dragging the mouse and it's the left button that we're dragging. 
Then we're going to say x axis active equals true, which we don't have yet, and y axis active equals false, which we also don't have yet. So let's add these real quick. These are basically just saying, okay, we're actually in the midst of dragging these. Okay, so hot just means that we're hovering. Active means we're actually dragging. We're interacting with the component or the gizmo. And then we'll go up here and we'll just say boolean x axis active equals false. And then I'll duplicate that and say y axis active also equals false. So now we can go down here and then we'll say, uh, we'll go up here and we'll modify this a little bit. We'll say if it's hot or it's active. So if it's hot or it's active, then it's just active. And if the mouse listener is dragging and the mouse button is down. Then we'll say else if y axis is hot or y axis is active and we're dragging the mouse and the mouse button is being pressed, the left mouse button. So if all this is true, then y axis is active. So we'll set that to true and uh, x axis is not active. So we'll set that to false. So this way we just know which one we are actually interacting with right now. And then if none of that is true, then we'll just say x axis is active is false and y axis active is also false. So neither of them are active if we're not dragging and actually holding on to either of them. Okay, so we have a bunch of stuff in here and I'm going to do something that's going to blow your guys' mind. Maybe not, but I'm going to go ahead and say let's refactor this whole class. So we're going to go into here and we're going to create a new class. I'm going to call this gizmo. All right, so this is just going to be a generic gizmo. And inside of this gizmo, we're going to create a constructor that basically looks the same exact as this. Actually, it's all going to look so similar that I'm going to go ahead and just copy all of this. And then we're going to go into gizmo and we're going to go paste everything. And I'm going to hit OK to import those. Then we're going to say this extends component. And we're going to change this to gizmo, the constructor, so that it matches. And we should have no errors in here. OK, cool. We have no errors. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make the active property protected. And I'm going to do that for both of these. And then I'm also going to make the active game object protected. So we have this protected, protected, protected. Cool. Now what does this do? This isn't really cool. Well, it actually makes it so that we can make more gizmos really easily. So I'm going to just change this to this extends gizmo instead of extends component. Then I'm going to go ahead and delete all of this. We don't need any of it. Uh, we can leave that in. And then what we're going to do instead is we're going to go in here. We're going to say super. And then we're going to call our parent constructor with the same parameters. So we just make sure we call the same parameters. We're good. I'm going to go ahead and delete all that. And we can actually delete all this too. So we can basically delete almost everything inside this class, which is really nice. And then delete all of this too, because we've moved it all into its parent class. So we still have all the functionality in here that we had before. It's just inside the parent class. So now if we go into, well, if we just run this, it should still run the same because we didn't lose any of the functionality. So if I click onto here, oh, and we have to make sure to call super.update too. So make sure to call super.update inside the update function. Now, if we go back into the game, and we click this. Okay, there we go. So you can see we still have all the functionality. We're just refactoring. Now that we have this though, we can go ahead and say if active game object does not equal null. And then we'll say if x axis is active, we're dragging the x axis gizmo. And then we'll just say active game object dot transform dot position dot x plus equals mouse listener dot get world dx. And let's see if this works properly. So now if we click onto the object and we click, okay, so it's working. I'm just doing it backwards. <laughs> so we need to change that to minus equals. And then we'll do the same thing with y axis active. Then we'll say active game object dot transform dot position dot y plus equals mouse listener. I think it is plus for this one dot get world dy. All right. So now if we run this and we click onto the object, we can move right and left and okay, Y was messed up too. So we need to change this to minus, but look at how easy that was. So now that we have all that functionality inherent in the parent, it was very simple to just do this and just drop in those couple of lines of code, which makes it so that now we can move it the correct way. And you'll notice that we're getting some problems. Like if I go up here and then I accidentally hit the x-axis, I switched to that one. So we can fix that. And we're also getting some weird lagging errors. So first of all, we can fix the weird lagging errors just by moving that down. 
Uh, basically, if we update after we move, that ensures that the gizmos are in sync with the game object, whereas before they weren't. So now if we go back, click onto this, moving up and down, it sticks with the mouse, which is good, but I'm still getting some weird errors for the X position. And that's actually caused by something in our mouse listener. So go back to mouse listener real quick. Uh, I believe it's happening because if we go back to end frame, we actually have to do this thing that we do with the last X's with the world X's as well. Let's just make sure that if we don't move the mouse, then the DX will reset itself essentially. So I'm just, just get change all this so that we're matching the other one. All right, if we go back in, we should get rid of that error now. And then there's just one more we have to fix. So now if we go, we are perfectly fine when we move them. But if I move up and down really fast and I hit the right arrow, then it switches to that. We can fix that too, just by going into the translate gizmo and saying if X axis is active and not Y axis is active. Okay, that should fix everything. So now it should just work. And you can see if I click onto here, click the Y, I move it, click the X, I move it. That's pretty awesome. It's not that hard to do too. Like we can literally just go into here and write a couple lines of code. Now let's do the th same thing for scale gizmo, okay? So I'm gonna go into here and say new class scale gizmo, and I'm gonna hit enter. And then I'm just gonna copy and paste all of this right into scale gizmo. And then I'm just gonna change this to scale gizmo instead. And we're gonna change this to scale sprite. So we want a different sprite passed in as well, which should be good. Uh, we're gonna say this extends gizmo. That way we get all of our functionality. And then instead of doing position.x, we're gonna do scale.x and scale.y. It really is this simple, okay? Except we will have one more problem uh, that we'll see in just a minute. So first of all though, let's go ahead and go into our level editor scene. If we go into here, we want to just make sure that we add in two more components to this. So we add the translate component. Let's go into level editor stuff and we'll say add component, new scale gizmo. I'm gonna go ahead and say it's gizmos.getSprite2. And then we're gonna say window.getImGUILayer.getPropertiesWindow. dot get window. And the way that we're gonna do this is I'm just, I have another uh, sprite that I will give to you guys in the download link so that you can get the proper sprite and then just go down to the gizmos.png and then change the number of sprites to three and you should have the scale gizmo included in there too, or the scale, the sprite, so that we get the correct sprite here. So just make sure you go into the assets directory images and get a new gizmos PNG image. That way you have the scale, free scale and free move, whatever, and then the translate gizmos. So as long as you have those, you should be good. And then we can go and we'll click this and you'll notice that we will get the scale gizmo as well. So we get the scale gizmo, but it's moving and it's scaling at the same time. Why is that? Well, that's because we have attached both the translate and the scale gizmo to the same level editor component. So if we remove translate, if we comment this out, then we'll just get the scale gizmo. And if we remove the other one, we'll just get the translate gizmo, but that's not really ideal. Ideally, we'd like to be able to just have both of them, right? So how do we solve this problem? We make a gizmo system. So we'll say add a new component gizmo system. And this gizmo system will take care of figuring out who should be updated when and everything. So we'll go ahead and we will actually move this into the gizmo system. Uh, let's go into components, create a new class, call this gizmo system. We're gonna say he extends component. And then we're gonna go ahead and say, this guy takes in a private sprite sheet gizmos and so this is gonna be the gizmo sprite sheet and then we're gonna say int using gizmo equals zero so if it's zero we're using the translate gizmo if it's one we're using the scale gizmo basically then we're just gonna go ahead and say public gizmo system this takes in a sprite sheet sprite gizmo sprites then we'll say gizmos equals gizmos sprites then we'll go ahead and go and at override public void start and inside of here, we'll move those creation of those things into here. So we'll go into level editor scene. And where we have these, we're gonna go ahead and copy that and then go back into gizmo system. Then we're gonna paste that into here. And then instead of adding it to level editor stuff, we're gonna add it to this game object. So we're gonna say game object to add component, game object to add component. That should be good. 
Then we'll go down here and we'll say at override public void update float delta time. And we'll say if using gizmo equals zero, then basically we just want some way to set it to say, hey, we're using the translate, not the scale. Um, so if we go into gizmo, we will actually add in one more function to this, or two more functions. We'll say public void set using, and this will say this dot using equals true, which we don't have yet. And then we'll say public void set not using, and this will set this dot using equal to false, which we don't have yet. Let's go back to the top. Up here, we'll just say private boolean using equals false originally, and then we can set it to true. And then right up in our update method, we'll just say if not using, then return. So if we're not using this gizmo, we don't actually run the update method, which is how we'll make all this possible. Then inside gizmo system, we can say if we're using gizmo zero, we'll say game object dot get component, translate gizmo dot class dot set using. And then we'll say game object dot get component scale gizmo dot class dot set not using. And then we'll say else if using gizmo equals one. So if we're using the scale gizmo, then we'll copy paste this. And then we'll set this to not using. And we will set this one to using. So this way we only update one of them, whichever one we're actually using at the moment. And we will only draw whichever one we're actually using at the moment because we'll go into here and when we set it to not using, we will also say this dot set inactive. That way we can't see it, it's out of sight, out of mind. Now, how do we switch between the gizmos? We can switch just by checking for a key press. So we'll say if the key is pressed and I'm gonna set this to glfw key E um, and then I'm gonna import that. I'm gonna say using gizmo equals zero else if key listener dot is key pressed, glfw key R, then we will say using gizmo equals one. So if you press E, you switch to translate. If you press R, you switch to uh, scale. And I might switch this to W and E. I'm not sure what Unity and Unreal use, but I know they use something like that. Okay. Anyways, though, we need to go back into level editor scene because we have to fix one more thing, which is actually supply this with the gizmo sprites. So we'll just supply that. Now, if we run this, Fingers crossed, everything should work. So if I click onto him, you'll notice we get the translate gizmos and they work fine. And if I hit R, then I get the scale gizmos and we're just scaling. And if I hit E, I switch back and you can go on and do whatever you want. Okay though, <laughs> that's it for gizmos. Uh, we'll add rotate gizmo in eventually. One other thing that I wanna mention, I know there's this bug where if you add in a new object, the gizmos are behind it. That's because we don't have Z indexing. So Z indexing will be the next thing we'll cover just so that we can actually get proper Z indexing working with our batches and actually put objects in front of each other. But that covers it for this tutorial. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please hit like and subscribe. They've been a little long lately, but this way we can get more stuff done at least. Uh, Stay tuned for the next episode when we'll be adding Z indexing. And then hopefully soon after that, we'll be working on hopefully like text rendering or something because it's about time we start adding those. Most likely we'll be working on the properties panel next and getting this up and running so that we can actually click on objects and change more than just their sprite render. Anyways, I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Thanks.